those implanted uh, will have substantial improvement in, the, in their problem. Again, it's not a cure all at all. And in fact, it seems less directed to the actual disorder. I mean, so deep brain stimulation in the this back of the hypothalamus, people still argue about which area it is, but that's a kind of silly argument. I should say that in passing. The, um, what this structure is is not resolved. And people get all excited about what to call it. But it is what it is. Um, and that's what it will be shown to be. We're working at the moment with a, um, with a brain from a cluster patient I looked after many years ago who died for some other cause and left him with the brain, which was always an interesting. Um, I shall never forget the phone call when his wife rang up and said that he died and, um, you know, could I come and pick his brain up, so to speak. <laughs> and it was uh, quite interesting. By a century conversation, it's not that easy to get a person's brain, even if they want you to have it. Um, once you die, unsurprisingly, you lose control over uh, many things. And anyway, she was very good about it, and uh, it's been really helpful. What it turns out is that this area of the brain um, that's important has not actually been defined before. You'd think everything was known about the brain, but the structures in it are not defined. It's a bit of a black box back that in this area is a bit of a black box in terms of what types of nerve cells are in there and what the, um, the, what the definitions of the, the structures are. So it's taken us some while to parse out the black box. We're quite act active uh, in doing it. Um, I've just been contacted recently by someone who's also interested in, in donating. So I've started to sort out at my institution how we're going to handle these donations because there's no doubt that the understanding the nature of the structure of what's going on in that part of the brain of what is different about that part of the brain compared to perhaps the other side or compared to um, people who don't have the disorder must tell us something about the kind of chemicals the brain transmitters that are important plus the headache, so it's a, that, that's an important thing. And the, the area, I think we'll end up having to you know, come up with a new name for this area to say everyone doesn't get excited about it. You know, we get a, a name that reflects the, uh, the, 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 the reflects properly the role that it has. So uh, you probably see people babble about what to call this. I think they're just babbling because the functional imaging is a statistical thing and it shows you approximately where something is. What will sort this out is proper anatomical pathology. And sadly, that's going to be with people who are dead because that's the only way to do it. Um, and it's, that's slow because not too many patients die. Excellent. Um, but that's the way it's going to be. ONS, I talked about. Uh, I want to say a few things about what's happening in the future. Um, it's a sort of future, but it's, it's now. I mean, I, I've got a few things. You've probably seen these needle-free um, sumatriptan injections that developed out of this vaccination technology that the US Army used in, uh, some time ago. You see this poor chap having everything blasted into it here. Um, you can, this is a nitrogen-driven syringe that you, 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 that you put um, either on the, uh, uh, you know, onto the abdomen or the uh, thigh, and, um, but not on the arm. I say that because of the illustration here. And the sumatriptan driven through the skin. Um, I mean, it's needle free, so if you're scared of needles, it's a perfect uh, thing to use. Uh, but on the foot, I mean, my patients tell me it's not pain free. Uh, well, that's, a, that's, the sort, that's where this technology's headed. I'm a big Star Trek fan, so I'm, I'm sure one day it'll be just and it won't hurt. But at the moment, it's and just things um, This will. This is a development to watch for because it may have some interesting implications. This is a, a device, an inhalation device developed by Matt Pharmaceuticals there in California. These are the data from a, from a migraine study. Um, the, this is a large study. This will result in the drug being licensed by the uh, FDA. Now, the hydrogonamic is an old drug that's from the 1940s. It's helpful in cluster headache a little bit. The nasal delivery is not too good. Injections a bit of a drag. Um, if you give it intravenously, you get a, you get a, you can turn off some uh, valves. Having a better delivery system for that would be really helpful. And I think studying this in cluster would be really quite useful, particularly for 
relative people with episodic cluster, perhaps with a bounce or a little bit shorter, because I think that this would probably have both an effect on attacks, that is, act like, say, uh, zonoclanes or spray or like pseudotryptin injections comparable to that, but it will probably have a preventive effect over time and build up so that a person would maybe treat two attacks on the first for the first week or so, and then they find their attack frequency go down. And it's likely that this will have some um, cumulative um, uh, preventive effect. And it's, uh, I think it would be quite, quite useful if we could study this in, in um, cluster header. It's with the FDA looking at the migraine approval at the moment. That will probably be done by the, maybe the middle of next year, something like that. I, mean, I don't know anything. I'm not saying that because I know anything in particular. I want to emphasize that for the webcast in case some analyst person thinks I know something in particular. I'm just guessing, it's a guess. Um, but the, the cluster would be a very interesting uh, indication to try and um, study this. And it's again the sort of thing that we uh, might want to approach your uh, group about more, more broadly. And it would, yeah, I'd want to do it with placebo. I just want to do things um, in a very scientifically uh, uh, responsible way so that people believe everything that we do. So that, that's coming along, you see this device. The, the clever thing about this inhaled thing, it spins things around, spins the stuff around, so instead of it crashing it's, it's when you breathe it in, instead of it going bash into the back of the throat and then being swallowed, it spins it around so that it actually gets, um, and it's breath actuated, so it actually gets inhaled. And the lungs are a very big surface area for absorption, so the absorption is um, very good. This is another thing that will happen. Um, again, it will need to be studied in cluster headache. This is one of the. This is just the, one of the studies. There's several studies being done with these drugs. So, what tryptans do? If you imagine that this is a nerve cell, this is a nerve coming onto another nerve cell. What tryptans do? Nerve cells talk to each other by chemicals that are released across something called the, the difference here is called the synapse. The area here is called the synapse. So. What tryptans do is block the transmission of chemicals going across this area called the synapse. So they stop this nerve cell talking to this nerve cell, more or less. It's more complex than that, I realise, but yeah, it's a summary that will serve for it. What turns out that across this synapse, the most important transmitter chemical that's, that's working there is called calcitonin genulated peptide, or CGRP. It turns out that that's released in migraine. It turns out that if you block that with a CGRP blocker, in fact, what you do is you block the, what it does on the other side, so-called CGRP receptor, that has, um, that stops migraine. This is, this drug is no longer in um, development. It was a burring a compound called Olsegipan. Um, it's only available intravenously, so it's not going to be the future. But there's a tablet, a couple of companies are, are developing uh, these things, and they'll probably be in, in migraine in the next, um, maybe, 12 months, maybe 18 months, something like that. But it's not going to be next week, but it's not going to be next decade either. Um, the important thing about these, these things is that they don't restrict blood vessels. So some of you cluster will be aware of this problem that um, if you've got, particularly if you're men and you smoke and you're just and you're overweight, everyone's nervous about the effect of these tryptans so because they constrict blood vessels on your um, on 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 your, on your heart. This doesn't seem to be a problem with CGRP receptor antagonists because they don't constrict blood vessels. Um, they block the effect of this chemical going across the, um, the, the synapse. Why say all that? Because we showed several years ago, this is one of the studies that got me really interested in cluster headache, I have to say, because I was interested in it, um, like seeing patients in clinic and doing research and so forth. But what really took me to a new level of interest was when I had to go uh, have to, I wanted to um, go and see, come and see people that were coming along to the hospital with acute cluster headache to take blood from them to look at what chemicals were in, in the blood. And we found this, uh, found calcitonin generated peptide uh, CGRP elevated in, in cluster headache, just as we've done in migraine. And we gave me the opportunity to see people during an attack, which is one which, of course, if you don't have the disorder, is quite a salutary experience and if you see enough of it it becomes a very salutary experience. So for me it was a very pivotal study in my thinking about wanting to be involved in the disorder uh, and we showed this so CGRP really. So it's very likely that CGRP receptor antagonists would work in cluster headache. And that's a testable thing. 
um, you know, properly designed uh, 